Go for it. Go for it. Hello, Andrea. <laughs> So everyone, as you know, um, we are Journey Beyond. Um, it's just a, a presentation that we've set up today to go over the hot and trending destinations in Africa. Now, in all honesty, this was a really difficult decision for us to set up because all the destinations in Africa to us are hot and trending and fantastic, all for different reasons. My dad always says, and I don't have children, but my dad always says, if you try and choose your favorite child, you understand what it's like choosing your favorite destination in Africa. Um, you love them all the same, just differently. Um, but yeah, we sort of decided based on the trends we've been seeing to go over one country in the East African circuit, which is Rwanda, um, and two countries in the Southern African circuit, which is South Africa and Botswana. Uh, and before we go into any of that, we really just wanted to highlight a route that we're really, really excited about. We're really excited about the LATAM flight. There's also obviously the SAA flights. We just wanted to highlight quickly how important a flight that actually is for Africa travel, because it's not just getting you to South Africa, but through Johannesburg, you can connect to all parts of Africa, whether it's East Coast, um, Southern Africa, Madagascar. One thing to quickly point out, we got this photo from OR Tambo, um, our international airport. They managed to think that Nozzy B is on the southeast coast of Madagascar. It's not. It's on the northeast coast. Um, so if you're going to be really pedantic, that's one thing that me and my dad uh, noticed immediately and pointed out to one another. But the rest of the destinations are pretty much where they're supposed to be. So um, yeah, let's go into the real into the the real presentation now. Um, I see my mouse keeps going off, but uh, we're going into Southern Africa. South Africa is obviously, you know, the biggest USP of South Africa is just how well-rounded a destination it is. Um, whether it's for first-time travelers, for second-time travelers, return travelers, there's really something in South Africa for them to do. Um, you've got obviously the wine, food, and culture in Cape Town and the Winelands, and you've got the big game in the Greater Kruger. You've also got other destinations that we'll go on to in a second, um, but it's just a fully, fully well-rounded country that really offers something for everyone. These are some of the destinations. Uh, this presentation will be sent to you afterwards, so you can go back and look at a couple of them because we're just going to highlight the important ones and maybe not important is the wrong word, but the, the more traveled ones that tend to fit into your general itinerary. Obviously, we've got Cape Town. There's beautiful parts of the Boer Cop in Cape Town, Boulders Beach, Robben Island, and then we've got Cape Town itself. Ideally, if you're going to send clients to Cape Town, I'd always say, you know, my, my dad sort of sh not shouted at me, but corrected me when I said that you should be doing five nights in Cape Town because there is that much to do. But on a typical safari for clients, four nights is pretty much standard. You can do everything in that time. You can do a day trip out to the Winelands if they don't have time to do time in the Winelands. Um, or you can get away with three and then spend two days out in the Winelands, which we'll get into a little bit later. But Cape Town, other than having amazing culture, its sightseeing is really what attracts it. You've got one of the world, um, uh, one of the world, not heritage sites, Dad, help me out, uh, um, landmarks of the world um, with Table Mountain. You've obviously got Robin Island, which is where uh, is a prison where you can learn about the actual cells that Nelson Mandela, our ex-president, um, was housed in. You've got the Boer Cop with Cape Malay. You've got the V&A waterfront. That's where, you know, the shopping happens. The real vibe at night happens. You can have cocktails or high-end restaurants um, or just world-class shopping centers. There's Cape Point, which takes you to the very southern point of, Cape, of, of the Cape and of Africa. Um, there's penguins, which not many people know exist in Africa, but they are there. Cape Town is definitely a great destination, but it's not one I'd say you go swimming in. Um, the sharks aren't the biggest problem. The water is what will get you first because of how cold it is, um, which not a lot of people register. Um, and then you've got other fantastic experiences like helicopter excursions and uh, winelands inside Cape Town on working wine farms like Constantia. Now, Obviously, when you're sending clients to Cape Town, which property to put them in is an important aspect, um, mostly so where in Cape Town you want to have them. If they're of the younger generation like me, I'd like to say that, um, you want to put them into sort of the hustle and bustle of the v &A, where they can be right next to all the restaurants or some of the clubs or some of the parties. Um, having said that, it's not like there's just music pounding everywhere. It's um, just a really good vibey area and puts you in close to a lot of the touristy spots. There's 
properties then like the silo one and only cape town cape grace and a couple others there's also going on the promenade um which is a beautiful strip of beach with a lot of shops and restaurants and cocktail um sort of centers on top of it um in camps bay where you have the marley pods further down you have 12 apostles and a bit further up you've got element house and then there's some properties in constantia in the city like balmont mont nelson and steenberg this is a photo of camps bay I always say that Cape Town on a perfect day is probably the prettiest place on the planet. I'm slightly biased on that, obviously, because I I, I love Cape Town. Um, but some take people a... with Sao Paulo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, listen, Sao, Sao Paulo is pretty pretty too. I tell you what. Um, but yeah, Camps Bay. Taking a look at that, you're looking onto the Twelve yeah. Apostles mountain range, um, going straight from the ocean straight into these mountains um, on a beautiful clear day. It's uh, it really is stunning. And we're going to Oman as well. I'm going to let my dad take over. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, we're at Hermanus. You know, this is uh, on the Cape Coast. And, of course, it's really well known for the whales that visit there between June and November. Um, in that time, you can do some of the world's best land-based whale watching. It means you don't even have to go into the water on a boat or something but of course they are both um, uh, boat trips for whale watching as well as small aircraft that will take you over it and in this area is the shark cage diving Alex are you gonna there we go um, well, you so, see the great whites which uh, yeah. in all honesty aren't actually in the bay all that often anymore um, because of the orcas that are there, but it also means that you can see the orcas every now and again if you're very lucky. Um, and uh, products like Krutbos exist as well. Dad, you you know Krutbos a lot better than me, so you explain it. Yeah, you know, um, the terrain around Cape Town contains um, the Feinbos floral kingdom. The Feinbos means fine bush in English, our friend boss being Afrikaans, and there are more species of plants and flowers in these couple of thousand um, um, square kilometers than they are in the entire Amazon. And that's one of the things you encounter at Hrithbos. Uh, they have wonderful community upliftment um, uh, projects. It's a really interesting place. You go for walks, you go for drives, you can horse ride, and um, of course, see the whales. And then we go into, I mean, we've already listed some of the experiences with the whale migration. It's a local town yeah. on the, on the <laughs> shorefront of, of the Manus, the flora and fauna, um, and all of those. Obviously, there's a couple of properties in the area that we sort of look at um, when we're sending clients. I uh, just the... wanted to point out to the Yemel in Arda Valley. Alex, yeah. just let me, can you put your cursor on that? Or yeah. doesn't it work like that? Yeah. Um, there we go. Anyway, no, it doesn't go there. Um, the Yemel in Arda Valley is one of our really good uh, wine uh, producing areas. And there's some great vineyards in that area, great restaurants to go to so also all accessible from here and the properties of course Birkenhead House of the Royal Portfolio you almost all I'm sure know of La Reza Dance and the Silo and of course Royal Malawan uh, but Birkenhead House is their property um, at Hermanus and Mosaic is sort of a more adventurous younger and um, cheaper alternative to Hrithbos. They have lots of activities, kayaking, they're on a lagoon, uh, they have quad bikes, they have fat bikes to ride, all of that. And in the town of Amanas, you have the Marine Hotel. Yeah, and then um, we obviously go another area in that Cape, Cape sort of area is the Winelands. Um, there's a real highlight in the Winelands of good food, good wine. I mean, it wouldn't be called the Winelands if it wasn't, where you can stay in some really operating um, vineyards that still create wine to this day, like Babylon's Touring. Um, the Winelands is broken up into a couple of areas, Franchuk and Stellenbosch probably being the most prominent. You've also got Paul and you've got Algin. 
Um, this is what we were talking about earlier when you were talking about how many nights to stay in Cape Town. Ideally, in the Winelands, you want to spend two nights. Actually, you probably generally always spend two nights, but you can spend more if you choose. Um, if you're going to spend one night doing a day trip out into the Winelands is, uh, is more ideal. Um, and then you can spend more time in Cape Town and still get that, that fantastic experience. There's a couple properties to really go over in, in the Winelands. I'm sure we all know La Residence. I know, I'm sure we all know Dale Graf. There's Liu Estates, Liu House. There's Babylon's Turin. And there's uh, Lanzarat, um, which leads us into the first part of why most people come to Africa and a place we really want to highlight um, for game viewing, which is the Kalahari. Obviously, the Kalahari is a beautiful desert-like area. It's more similar to Namibia or the Kalahari in Botswana in that sense, um, but it's obviously in South Africa. It's obvious, It's it's a four big four area because it has no elephants, and generally we tend to steer away from big four areas because most people come to Africa for their one trip to see the big five. Now, Tualu and the Kalahari is a little bit different in that sense because you're almost always going to be coupling up Tualu with a Greater Kruger National Camp, um, just because of how it sort of works in that sense. Um, sorry, Pa, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I got a phone call. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you would couple up Tualu with a Greater Kruger National um, Park Camp. Um, and it's a fantastic experience with its orange sands and just the smaller things in life as well. There's other things like, like meerkats standing on your heads and your shoulders. These are completely wild animals. Um, they do this on their own accord. The reason they do it is because the Kalahari is very flat. So these little animals find any sort of mound or tree or, or stump to stand on top of to survey for predators. And obviously, um, having a look at a human sitting there it turns into a, a bit of a good viewing platform that they love. Um, but yeah, there's obviously Johannesburg. Johannesburg is still a fantastic one-stop um, overnight or two-night destination. Most flights come into Johannesburg. So doing two nights here, doing the Apartheid Museum, the Soweto Museum or the Nelson Mandela Museum is a really good way to pass the time here and further um, encapsulate yourself in the culture that makes South Africa so special. And it leads us to probably the biggest reason why anyone comes to Africa in the first place, the game viewing, and most specifically, the Greater Kruger National Park. Now, why we say the Greater Kruger? It's because the Greater Kruger is where the private concessions exist. The Kruger National Park is what me and my dad used to drive to when I was younger and drive through ourselves. You'd be in the gate at six, you'd have lunch at one of the rest camps, and you'd leave just before the gates close. Um, and that's typically what us South Africans do or locals do. Whereas in the Greater Kruger National Park, they're private parks with private reserves, with private ownership, where you can drive off-road up to the animals. You can do walking safaris, fishing um, excursions. Um, you can do night drives. And there's just different rules in the Greater Kruger, which is why you should really put your clients in there so they have the fullest experience. The areas of the Greater Kruger, um, the ones we want to highlight at least, is the Timbavati, Thornybush, Klesiri, Sabi Sands, and Kapama. Um, it's not in that order, but they're all fantastic in their own sense. I also want to point out at this time, please go back. Um, you see on this map the Kruger National Park, and you see Skakusa Airport, Kruger Mpumalanga International Airport, and Hootspreit Airport. That's the one you all know as HDS. And when uh, for a very long time, you only had South African Airways flying into Sao Paulo um, as the way to get here before LATAM days. Um, they would always sell people an onward flight on SA Express to Hootspread. Well, SA Express is gone, and um, uh, yeah. Airlink and Semi now fly there. But you don't have to sell them to Hootspread. Look at Skakuza, that's right at the Sabi Sand um, down there. And the safari uh, lodges like Lion Sands, uh, Mala Mala, Sabi Sabi, and those will fetch the clients at Skakuza Airport and drive them to their safari lodge. You don't have to have a different uh, flight or a different road for Ankhfer. Kruger and Pumalanga, and both of these, that I mean, sorry, all three of these airports are accessible from Cape Town as well as from Johannesburg. 
so you can connect um, everywhere. It's really very uh, easy. And look at uh, Hootsprate, that serves uh, Kapama, of course, Timbavati, Manialeti, and the Klaseri and Salati up there. Um, so uh, you have to know which airport to use for which safari lodge you're sending your client to and vice versa, which, you know, as it all fits together. 100%. And it's more convenient these days. And obviously, we come to these areas to see these animals. God, uh, sorry about my dogs in the background. They uh, tend to have higher pitch voices than usual now. Um, but you see elephants, I mean, stunning leopards. And then these are some of the properties. As I said, the presentation will be sent to you. This is by all, not at all, all the properties that we support and, and look upon. Um, but they're just a short list of some of the good ones, um, of course. Leads us into our next destination being Botswana. Botswana is the premier destination for wildlife in Africa. This is because of the focus from the Botswana government for low impact lodges at a higher luxury level, which basically means there's less people and less vehicles traversing the land, um, which means that the wildlife is able to thrive, which makes it more raw, more wild, more real. Um, and obviously there's more diverse areas in Botswana as well with the Okavango Delta, um, Chobi, Maun, and then down into um, the Makhari Khari and Nai Pans. This, I mean, take a look at some of the river sources that uh, go through the Okavango. Um, but yeah, just putting the Okavango in a, in a little bit of a nutshell, I mean, we could spend hours and hours and hours just talking about this, but just breaking up into a few segments, there's the panhandle that leads down from Angola, the cylinder spillway that breaks off towards the northeast of it, Savuti, Linyanti, Maremi with Chiefs Island in the middle of Chiefs Island, which I think we anyone who knows about Botswana may know a little bit about Chiefs. It has Mombo and Chiefs Camp on it. And then all of these areas make up the Delta itself. Just to highlight how you should be traveling to the Delta, as I think in a presentation like this, this is the most important thing to be taking out of it. The biggest factor that most people don't consider is ensuring that clients go to both water and land-based camps. So if you're in a national park like Miremi, there are different rules that apply to those camps where they can't do Makoro rides, boat safaris, um, they can't do walking safaris or stargazing. So although they have some of the, some of the best wildlife viewing, you want to couple them up with a private concession camp where you can do water-based sort of activities like the Makoro rides, like the boat rides, like the fishing that makes you know, Botswana as unique as Botswana is. Again, going into how, how long you should be spending on these safaris, we understand that time is of the essence. So at least five days would be our suggestion. That'd be three nights at one camp, which I we would say is your land and water-based camp. And then two nights at maybe an only land-based camp if you want to um, mix it up that way. Obviously, more time is better. And if you're coupling it up with South Africa, you could get away with three nights. But there's so many things that go into a booking like that that you would take every factor into consideration. Some of the big properties to look over, you obviously have the Great Plains and Wilderness Premier Camps that I think we all know. Um, you have the And Beyond Camps, Natural Selection Camps, Desert and Delta, and one that we all know is Kijira from Red Carnation. This is their lookout deck, I'm sorry, stargazing deck where you can sleep in this makeshift baobab under the stars. Apparently, there's a guide that watches over you, but I think uh, it's still an exciting and, and fantastic experience itself. Um, this is your deck at Duba Plains as part of Great Plains. These are your rooms. So when we say that it's a tenting safari, um, don't think that this is going to be a tenting safari that um, you have in your head. This is the tents that we're talking about. They're massive rooms, massive beds, main areas, you know, sun beds, the whole lot. Um, there's, in, I mean, the amount of elephants that happen that go around in the Okavango Delta is next to none. Um, so it's it's everywhere you turn they're crossing water sources drinking water playing with one another it's fantastic this is your deck at Sitatunga. you would generally at night sit around that fireplace there and tell your war stories from the day what you saw and what everyone else saw um, and just have a fantastic experience going on to the makhari khari um this is the makhari khari this is actually kubu island which has just dethroned the cradle of humankind for having the most uh, the latest dated homo sapien um uh, evidence on this island in the middle of the Makhari Khari, um, which is a great destination to add to your itinerary. 
So this is places like Jack's Camp, Sand Camp, that um, you go out on quad bikes or you have meerkat excursions or you sleep out under the stars. Um, is also a fantastic flamingo migration that happens from February to, you know, sort of uh, end of beginning of February, March, and then um, a little bit of April, depends on the water sources. Um, that's a, obviously a huge, unique selling point. Kuba Island, as we said, and then the properties, like I said earlier, with Jack's Camp, Sand Camp, Camp Kalahari, all of those three being with natural selection. And then you've also got Ta Taupan and Ngaipan. Leading to one of my dad's favorite destinations, Rwanda. Um, we actually went there earlier this year to celebrate his 70th. So, um, dad, you want to tell us a bit about, about Rwanda? Uh, dad, I think you're muted. Sorry for that. Um, I was trying to stop my dogs barking, getting to you. Um, Kigali and Rwanda is surely the, the modern miracle of Africa. It has zero unemployment. There is not one piece of litter or rubbish that you can find in this country. It's the only country in the world where on a, the last Saturday of every month, everybody from the president down to the lowest citizen gets out into the street and cleans up the country. Um, I think all of us could do with a bit of that happening uh, around our own places. But it's because Rwanda was really traumatized by the genocide. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the movie uh, Hotel Rwanda or whatever it's called in your language. Um, and one of the things we do is take people to the Genocide Museum, the Parliamentary Museum, which is where it all kicked off. Uh, and of course, there's wonderful arts and culture, um, a really interesting, bustling little city. Um, and then from here, you go up to the uh, different areas. Alex, where's that? Yeah. The most important uh, aspect is the Volcanoes National Park and the visiting with the gorillas. Now, this has been going on for quite a long time. And of course, it's been going on in Uganda as well. But what happened is about five, six years ago, um, some really top quality products were built here, firstly by Wilderness at Basati and uh, there had been Sabinio of governor's uh, camps before, um, and then came uh, Singita Quatonda and eventually one and only uh, Gorilla's Nest. These are genuine five-star deluxe, you know, top-end properties and um, can stand next to anything you can think of in a hotel quality somewhere. So... Um, this is Singita Kutonda. It also has a four-bedroom uh, villa called Kataza House. It's, it even has its own um, uh, cinema uh, yeah. inside. It's a really stunning property with its own chef, butler, everything else. But at the end of the day, you still got to get out there into the forest and do your hiking. So um, that's Singita. And uh, next is um, Basati. No, that's uh, actually one and only. Um, the one and only uh, is a really good property. Uh, I would just say it's more of a resort um, property than either Basati or um, uh, Singita Quatonda. They are more uh, fitting in. And look at this for Basati. Um, the architect who we know who did this really created like gorillas uh, nests in the forest and there's only six of them so it's exclusive you have a guide uh, and he drives you up here and he's with you and takes care of you the whole time or you can fly up by helicopter or back by helicopter and you can join uh, volcanoes, which, by the way, I'm sure you all know, it's $1,500 for a um, 
uh, gorilla trick. Uh, there's also the golden monkey here to go and trek for. And of course, it's uh, the, the place of Diana Fossey, where she did her research, and Ellen De DeGeneres, the American TV star lady, has uh, funded a big uh, museum complex in her honor and where they do research on the uh, on the gorillas. Uh, and just, just, just a, uh, an important fact um, about Versace as well that may sometimes um, be taken into consideration for clients that have less time when they're traveling. They have a day room facility that's free of charge to the guests that they can do a trek on the morning, return back, even if they had to have been checked out type of thing, um, have a nice shower, be able to change their clothes, have a good lunch cooked by the wilderness team, which is obviously always at the highest standard, um, before getting picked up for their transfer if they have a late night flight flying out at 10, 11 p.m. type of thing out of Kigali. So that's just another really important thing yeah. to remember. About the yeah, and I wanted to say the driving time between Kigali and um, volcanoes is two and a half hours. To drive to Nungui is five hours. Uh, so maybe more motivation for the helicopter on that. But there and are fascinating things to see en route, believe me. They are. And yep. that's a good point, Dad, about, um, about the helicopter flight time, because it's actually the same amount of time to fly by a helicopter to Kiga from Kigali to volcanoes as it is from Kigali to Nungui, um, around 40, 45 minutes, um, if you're on the, the sort of conservative side. The reason it takes five hours to get out to Nungui is because of how windy the roads are up the mountains. But like you said, for some people that just want to experience the whole country, that's a fantastic viewing opportunity. And you see a lot of the country in that. Um, yeah. And I want to add that uh, the roads in uh, Rwanda are excellent. They tar roads. Um, they not. You mustn't think of it like Africa in Botswana. Oh my God! Um, you know it's not like that at all. Um, it's just it's very hilly, uh, and they you can't go that fast. So um, winding. If you get stuck behind a truck, we'll tell you firsthand. It uh, you go at the truck's pace. It's uh, there's no e real easy way to get around them. So you just sit there and, and go. Um, and the but property I'm, to use here, of course, is one and only Nungwe House. Um, they offer you can do um, the chimpanzee experience. They have a very high walkway in the canopies of the trees, which is beautiful, and then. There's a, it's a tea plantation area. So you have the beautiful tea plantations, but you also do tastings and experience the African tea concept. 100%. It also leads us into Akigira. Um, this is the big five national park in Rwanda that's sometimes lesser known um, to people who are selling Rwanda. Um, in all honesty, there are fantastic options in Kenya and Tanzania that are an easy flight and an easy connection away. And the big five queuing in Akagera is maybe not yet at the standard of Kenya and Tanzania. So your client's entire goal is to see the big five or see a lot of animals. It may be best to try and couple it up with Kenya or Tanzania rather than putting them in Akagera. But if they're trying to experience the whole country, it's still a great option. You've got properties like Magashi by Wilderness, You've also got a Mantis property of Akagira. Um, and again, it's two hours drive from Kigali, um, which makes it uh, easily accessible. In all honesty, it's it's currently supported by African parks, which needs a little bit of help in that sense. Um, and they need a bit of funding and they need a bit of, uh, a bit of love. Whilst we uh, have a little bit of time, there's also a few other destinations to consider. If we were to go over all the destinations, we definitely would have um, run out of time. Um, so just a little crash course about all of these. We go into um, Kenya, as mentioned, now is a fantastic, fantastic game viewing destination. You've got the great migration that happens there with the river crossings. Um, you've got Amboseli National Park with the big tuskers. If you know anything about Amboseli and you know the name Craig, um, it's one of the big tusker elephants that are famous over there. You've got Nairobi, which is now artisanal. It's coffee. It's coffee is really taken off. Everyone knows Kenya for coffee as well. 
um, and its other biggest export, which is roses. Um, and of course, you've got the Maasai experience with the Maasai warriors, where if you're like me, you'll go jump with them and uh, hopefully win a, a, a lady's hand in marriage. Um, there's also Tanzania, which is its southern cousin. Um, obviously, in Tanzania, there's the Grumeti Sorry, Reserve. Alex. Yes? We, we have a question here. Um, sure. What is the minimum height for gorillas trekking? Ooh, no, no it's not there's height, no, it's age. Yeah, there's no minimum height, there's minimum age, and that's 15. So you have to be older than 15 years old to go on the, the gorilla trek. Um, yeah, but they, they definitely don't discriminate to height. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I know why... It's that... by age. It's minimum, yeah, it's yeah. okay. By age. And I have tried several times in my life to beat that for people with more money than you can think of, and you cannot beat it, okay? It doesn't happen. And anybody who advertises that they can get anybody gorilla trekking under the age of 15, um, don't send them your money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank no, you. It... Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Philippe. Of course. Of yeah. course. Um, then we've got Tanzania, which also has a great migration in it. Um, you've got Ngorongoro Crater towards the south southeast. There's obviously Singer um, Serengeti National Park, um, the Lamai Triangle, and like I said earlier, the Grumeti Reserves by Singita that I think we all know. Um, it's also just actually like Kenya and Rwanda for that matter, really easy to couple up with Zanzibar. There's also direct flights out of South Africa. So Zanzibar is a beach destination for post-safari, is a good destination to link up with along the Seychelles, um, Mauritius, Madagascar, the, the lot of them. Um, and finally, the one that's at the very top of my bucket list, because um, my dad speaks so highly of it, um, is Namibia. Um, it's amazing for return clients. Um, these are clients that have come to Africa, they've experienced the, the migration or they experienced the big five and the greater Kruger. And now they're wanting to come back because they love the people so much, as most people do, and um, experience the little things. This is where you look at the little beetles running up the, the dunes. Um, you see the lone oryxes like this. You see the desert elephants, um, desert lions and how they survive in such a harsh environment, as well as just being in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Um, and looking at the stars above you because there's no light pollution. There's also the Himba tribe, um, which is a fantastic, fantastic experience. Um, but that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Yeah. Anybody out there? <laughs> yes, I was. I was waiting for Julieta to see if she was going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, but she's no, going to was... have a little lie down. <laughs> No, but it was really amazing. I think there's so much to explore in, in, in the Africa continent. Yeah, no, you know, sure. I, sure. Think, I think the big thing, Paula, is it is so hard to um, give time to enough of each thing because people will say, oh, no, but I don't need to know that much about this, which, of course, they do, actually. Um and people want to get a broad overview and understanding of that. So um, I think we need to have our uh, audience come back and say, we want more on this, we want more on that. Because um, I was reminded that one of my favorite things with planning safaris, I never use for Brazilians. And that is because they like to shop. So we should always have the shopping experience at the end because they don't want to slip the luggage and the goods and everything with them. Plus, in lots of times when you're visiting safari lodges, whether it's in South Africa or Botswana or anywhere, there's luggage restrictions um, that um, um, you... Um, you need to be at this uh, the thing at the end, uh, the shopping area at the end. So normally I plan that people finish with the safari because that's the highlight, like a opera or like a book or whatever. You know, it's the, the end of the story that really matters. Um, but 
you must remember that they don't want to ship all that stuff with them and you should really have the safari first then. I think if Brazilians... And, yeah, that, I have Brazilian. never, ever in my life heard of that short person can't go. Yeah. I want to just ask the, the participant, um, did, uh, did somebody really say that for you? Do you know somebody short that try to go? I think whilst we wait for her reply, I, I can assure you that there is no height restriction for gorilla trekking at all. There's um, no age restriction either. There is a for gorilla trekking. Of course, there's. It's 15 years old. No, no, no. I meant old age, because somebody oh, yeah. who has uh, mobility problems and so we actually have them carried up the uh, the mountain in a sedan chair type of uh, situation. You know, like an yeah. old. Uh, uh, Marie Antoinette in the time of uh, the French Revolution, that type of thing, you know. Um, Ariel, I hope I'm saying that right. The best time of the year to go to the Okavango Delta, um, that's definitely June, July, August. Um, that's, you know, the flooding season of the Delta. Um, basically, how the floods work in the Delta is up in Angola, in the Angolan Highlands. There's a lot of rain that happens at a certain time of the year towards the beginning of the year, January, February. And it takes a couple of months for all the water to seep through the channels, go over uh, uh, an escarpment and into the delta. And the delta from highest point of the delta to the lowest point of the delta only differs by four meters in altitude, which is why the water spreads out like little fingers. Um, so that's the best months to go because that's A, when there's the most water and the most beautiful and B, um, when there's that much water, it creates little pockets of islands, in a sense. And these animals tend to stick towards islands and go from one to the other. So finding the animals, although in the rest of Africa, you want as little water as possible, actually becomes a bit easier because there's um, little pockets of animals around and the, the guides at these at these lodges know that. Um, and then for Namibia, Dad, do you want to handle Namibia? Because, like I said, it's still on my bucket what list. Was asked about Namibia? The best time of the year to go to Namibia. Um, it's it's the same months, really. Uh, I'm not fond of August because there's a prevailing wind that blows. And um, you really don't want to be there in that. But it is absolutely full at that time with demand from Europe. Um, Italians, French, Germans, all of those, they all love Namibia and uh, love traveling there. And that's their vacation month, you know, August. Um, and I wanted, to make, uh, I wanted to make a point earlier on about uh, Botswana and the best time to go. Naturally, for the Okavango Delta, July through to end of August is the best month. In fact, you could go on to September probably too. But um, it does get drier outside of the Okavango at that time because there's no rain falling around that time. Just like here in South Africa, we don't have rain in our summer, uh, our winter months, um, which is the same as yours, um, but not winds. Um, and you end up with... Um, our summer months then being beautiful and green and all the trees and flowers are in flower. And of course, the animals have their babies. And when you have babies, you have lions and leopard and everybody that eats them. So, yes. Uh, the question about this, I hope that answered uh, that question. Um, I'll come back to it. The question about the Serengeti and the Big Five. Uh, you would have to combine the Serengeti with um, Ngorongora Crater because in Ngorongora Crater is um, rhino, quite a lot of rhino, um, but they're not so easily spotted outside in the Serengeti. You definitely um, will find some up in uh, Grometi Reserves sort of way. Um, but, uh, and then again, in Kenya, you can get to see them, you know, um, but, um, yeah.
I think Daniel, the best way to say it is the Serengeti for big four viewing is is really really spectacular. I mean, the the game sightings you have on this flat open landscape is really really spectacular. Um, Rhino, as my dad was saying, now is a little bit harder to see. It's still something that guests definitely do see, um, but just there for the migration um, and viewing in that sense is spectacular in itself. Um, and Ariel, I see as well. You ask if it's practical to combine the Delta and Namibia. Um, yes, you, you can. Are, you, you definitely yes. can. Um, it's it's You have to fly back down to Johannesburg to fly into Namibia. There's no direct flights, although they're next to each other yeah. to go straight across. Um, but yeah. it's definitely combinable in that sense. It's just about the length of time um, the clients have to travel. Yeah, it involves a flight from... Then took to Johannesburg and then from Johannesburg to Mount or vice versa, Mount to Johannesburg and up. And you you could actually go Vintuk or Wolfish Bay to Cape Town and then from Cape Town to Mount because they are direct flights from Cape Town to Mount too uh, on Airlink. In fact, um, uh, to give them a free punt, uh, Airlink, which is 4Z, 4Z, uh, really do serve most of the areas that we love and that our clients love to go to. For sure. For sure. And they're good and reliable. Thank Very you, much. Alex. Thank you, Philippe. I don't know if anyone has another question. I've done Namibia and Botswana in the same trip and really enjoy the change of scenery. Thank you, Mariana. Is that um, our Mariana? Is that our Mariana? I, which Mar I which think so. Fifteen, yeah. I, I've, done, I've done Namib and Botswana in the same trip, and I really enjoyed the change of scenery because uh, I did uh, Etosha, so a lot of desert and lots of animals, completely different than what I saw in Botswana because um we. We saw a lot of water and and it's oh, amazing please. because they are really close and it's so different and I really enjoy it. But there is the the what what happened with the flight is that you have to come back to Johannesburg and then fly fly out. So yeah. it is a little bit of a um of a pain to do that, the, but completely worth times, it. The flight times unfortunately also don't match up very well, so yeah. you don't get in yeah. early enough to Johannesburg to connect. So you have to do an overnight in Joburg. But again, Mariana can tell you firsthand, it's a fantastic experience because of the contrast. I mean, she says how close they are to each other. The Okavango Delta is actually technically in the Nabib and the, the Khalakhari and, and all that. The only reason it exists is because many, many years ago, a tectonic plate shift happened where basically the entire land sunk um, at the bottom of a major river coming out of Angola. And it then caused this area that the water would siphon into and spread across, which caused this natural floodplain, which is actually the largest natural delta um, on the planet. So that's the only reason. It's also why it's called the jewel of the Kalahari, because um, the Kalahari desert exists and it's a normal desert. But then this this lovely oasis of water exists um, in the middle of it. Yeah. And I should tell you, Mariana, that the... Um, Kalahari in Botswana is sand from the Namib Desert and it is a kilometer thick, you know, the, the sand. Um, and there's continual actual small earthquake type things happening there. Nobody feels them, nobody knows about them because the sand cushions it. Um, but that's what changes differences in where rivers flow around the Okavango, around Chief's Camp. So today, for instance, there's more water going around the northern part of Chief's Island than uh, there were many years ago. There was more water going around the southern part of Chief's Island. But, I hope, Ma I hope. but Mariana is 100% correct. It's a fantastic combination. And if you've seen Namibia, you think you can't see a place that's got less of anything, but is more beautiful. 
you know it's uh it's really the harshness the starkness um really is fantastic and then you get to the Okavango and everything is green and lush and and soft sort of thing you know i think yeah. i hope I hope this little chat at the end here also sort of proves to everyone that's watching that we really could spend hours and hours and hours <laughs> talking about every one of these destinations in particular. So I'm going to ask everyone that's watching to speak to the TL team and to us if you want to send an email to us. Let them know exactly what destinations you want to highlight and maybe we could have more of these sort of presentations on particular countries and really go more in depth about them and not just have sort of the overview like this. Um, it allows us to go more in depth about why things happen, why clients would go to certain places, um, and those sort of factors. So, speak up in yeah. that sense. I I do want to say that Alex and I debated about which countries we were going to mention tonight endlessly, endlessly. because we we did not discuss Mozambique, which is right next door to us, and there are some really good. Uh, island resorts there, beach resorts, and of course they speak Portuguese. One of the few countries in the world outside of Portugal and Brazil that speaks uh, Portuguese, so good for Brazilians. And um, with um, whether we should do Zimbabwe and Zambia, because with today's trend to more active holidays, you know, with clients hiking, cycling, uh, whatever more, um, Zambia is fantastic for that because it's where the walking safari originated. You've got boating, fishing, canoeing, and uh, walking, and great game viewing. And not bad pricing, by the way, just to mention. On top of that. No, yes, amazing we Amazing Thank you, Thank you all uh, very much. Thank you, and well, th thanks everyone for joining. We have here the Brazil, the US, the Mexico, the South American team. Anything you need, you just let us know. We put you in contact with a team from, from Journey Beyond. Hopefully we have more flights from South America going there. Please. <laughs> Please. We, will have, we will have, we're already seeing them, don't worry. Hopefully uh, got yeah. We need oh, more airlines to come. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Have you. a lovely day. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye.